In this session, in two parts, Jim Hopkins sets out to compare Davidson's work to that of Wittgenstein and Freud. In part one, the similarity with Wittgenstein is brought out in a discussion of Davidson's unified theory of interpretation. The similarity with Freud is explored in part two in an examination of Davidson's views about irrationality. Hopkins points out that the notion of a radical interpreter, a key notion in Davidson's philosophy, first appeared in Wittgenstein, and he asks whether Davidson or his close colleague W.V. Quine were ever influenced by that. In Quine's work, it will be recalled, a key role is played by a radical translator. Davidson suspects that Quine was not much influenced by Wittgenstein and explains that for his own part, although he read Wittgenstein closely and admired his work, he became aware only very recently that Wittgenstein had the example of the radical interpreter. Hopkins points out that unlike Wittgenstein, Davidson does not do conceptual analysis. Rather, he brings theory to bear on puzzling conceptual questions. This gives Davidson an opportunity to comment on the role of theory in his work and to give a thorough explanation of his unified theory of interpretation, his most recent view about how it is that we understand one another. Davidson explains the genesis of this theory, comparing it to and criticizing parts of Quine's approach to radical translation. And he comments on problems he encountered while formulating the theory. Hopkins invites Davidson to discuss the differences between his unified theory and his earlier views about interpretation, with particular regard to the role of the radical interpreter in Davidson's work, and he rounds off this section of the interview by making some further comparisons between Davidson and Wittgenstein. In part two, there follows a discussion of the various types of irrationality. Beginning with what Davidson thinks is the simplest form, wishful thinking, the discussants also cover acrasia and self-deception. Davidson explains in what sense he sees these phenomena to imply the existence of divided minds, and he offers reasons for why this conclusion, unintelligible to many philosophers, is both plausible and required. Throughout the discussion, Davidson emphasizes his view that irrationality can occur only in predominantly rational creatures. As he puts it, Irrationality is a disease of rationality, not an absence of it. Comparisons with Freud's work are drawn in the discussion. We now take up the talk at the London School of Economics. In this program, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Jim Hopkins, a reader in philosophy at King's College at the University of London. He's going to join Donald Davidson to consider uh, the basic data and concepts in Davidson's unified theory of interpretation, and he's also going to discuss how that impinges on Davidson's theory of rational and irrational action. Um, Donald, what I'd like to do is uh, ask you about the relation of your unified theory of interpretation to the work of two of your predecessors in investigating mind and meaning, Ludwig Wittgenstein and Sigmund Freud. The reason for focusing on Wittgenstein is that uh, I think it must strike uh, anyone that uh, your work, together with Quine's and Wittgenstein's, constitutes uh, an impressive instance of continuity and convergence in analytical philosophy. Uh, now, many people have, uh, and, and you yourself, have talked about the relations of your views to those of Quine. But uh, I think the figure of the radical interpreter first appears in the analytical tradition in the work of Wittgenstein, in Wittgenstein's uh, character of the uh, explorer interpreter who mm -hmm. tries to make sense of people whose uh, culture he's unfamiliar with and whose language he doesn't yet understand. And uh, I wonder if there was actually any direct influence there. Do you think that either Quine or yourself um, were influenced by Wittgenstein on, on this topic? Uh, I th uh, uh, Quine certainly has in print uh, recognized there were connections between his work and Wittgenstein. Uh, 
how influenced was he? Uh, I don't think I know the answer to that question, but my guess would be not much. Uh, I think Quine came to his views about language and his introduction of the sort of third person point of view toward the mind uh, from asking himself, uh, what does somebody who's listening to a speaker have to go on uh, in making one thing or another out of what they're saying? So he was, I think, quite on his own, uh, uh, getting well, partly in the empiricist tradition, uh, getting away from the idea that language is something that's laid up in heaven uh, that we're all trying to get right. Uh, and he thought, no, it's a, it's a human uh, concern. I, I think he, he uh, saw himself as following the American pragmatists, uh, perhaps more than he uh, thought of Wittgenstein. Uh, uh, and I, I, I was probably more influenced by Wittgenstein, at least in the sense that I spent a lot of time reading. Uh, Wittgenstein way way back in the 50s when the investigations was first coming out in English and um, and I'm sure I absorbed a great deal more than than uh, registered uh, in any direct way and then for you know decades I, I didn't look back very much uh, just was was going on in my own way, but probably influenced all along. Uh, because as you know, I was, I was uh, heavily influenced by people who were influenced by Wittgenstein, uh, Anscombe and, and uh, Hampshire, uh, John Wisdom, a lot, a lot of people who were uh, at Oxford too. People were very influenced by Wittgenstein, and, and I was reading them and, and uh, thinking about their points. But on this particular thing, I think uh, I, I, what, it wasn't until I read what you had written uh, that I realized the idea of the radical interpreter was in Wittgenstein. Well, <clears throat> although this is something we'll come back to, I think it might be worth saying that uh, the figure of the radical interpreter in Wittgenstein's work seems to come in as a solution, uh, such as he presents, to his question, how do I follow a rule? And that question, of course, is a very pregnant one because it touches at once on first-person authority, how I can know what to do, and on intention and on meaning. And in a sense, the, I suppose the shortest way to get... get uh, to to put the thing is to say that Wittgenstein says from the first person perspective there's no answer to this question. Any answer I could give would presuppose my first person authority and my grasp of my own mind and meaning. But if we look at the problem from the perspective of an interpreter trying to make sense of a group of people, we find that he absolutely can't do so unless there's an order in their behavior between uh, the, their utterances or the sentences they utter, he takes it, they'll be construed as sentences, and the way they act, that roughly speaking, they have to act in accord with their sentences for us to make sense of them at all. And it's this order then that seen through the eyes of the interpreter becomes the order that we discern in people's following a rule and acting intentionally. That at least is how I I think Wittgenstein should be read on that point, and I'll come back later to asking you about how that fundamental order that's discerned in Wittgenstein relates to the order that's discerned in your own unified theory. But uh, probably uh, it, we should begin somewhere else. We should begin with an obvious difference between your work and that of Wittgenstein. Uh, the, that is the way that uh, your work uses the notion of theory, and in particular theories analogous to those of fundamental measurement, as a mode of what we might call conceptual explanation. That is, uh, it, in your work we're no longer analyzing 
concepts, uh, and we're no longer considering simple language games in which salient things might stand out particularly clearly. We're bringing theory to bear on what the questions of conceptual explication that puzzle us. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could, uh, would like to try first to say anything general about how you think the use of theory casts light here. Well, uh, uh, th that, that's a good question, all right. And, and it's, uh, the answer isn't, isn't simple or, or even all that clear, perhaps. Uh, uh, I've often uh, written as if I thought of the uh, of any ordinary person hearing another person speak uh, as uh, building up a theory about what they mean by what they say at the same time that they uh, built up a theory about what they believe, what they want, what they intend, uh, and yet. Uh, there's, it sounds unreal to suppose that, that we go around all the time constructing elaborate theories. Uh, and my way of thinking about that, which has changed to some extent over the years, uh, uh, is the person who needs the explicit theory is the philosopher who is going to explain uh, what it is that that uh, we ordinarily uh, learn or figure out one way or another uh, from observing people and listening to them talk. Uh, the systematic theory, or at least the explicit systematic theory, is is mine, uh, and I'm. It's the only way I know to explain what to describe what I think a competent uh, speaker and, and uh, hearer comes to know and explain how it would be possible to come to know all that uh, given what's available uh, to people. Uh, so the theory is, the explicit theory anyway, just has this uh, function of explaining something that about other people, ordinary people, or ourselves actually in real life, uh, make speculating on uh, how we do what we clearly do do, uh, without, without ever feeling as though we're forced to uh, uh, set down some axioms or, or uh, write down the rules that are involved. So I, 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 I'm no longer as inclined as I once was to talk about the theory that ordinary people have, uh, but nevertheless, what they know is something extremely systematic, uh, and it's so systematic that you can't explain what it is or describe what it is without having a theory yourself. Mm. And of course, one might say that in a way the concept of a theory is actually very well suited to do this job, because a theory can lay out lots of conceptual relations uh, in, a, in an explicit way uh, and so uh, enable us to see how those concepts are related in a theory and this can cast light on how they're related in our own practice. Now, the, what one might regard actually as the culmination of your work in specifying uh, theory of this kind, the unified theory of interpretation, is paradoxically one of the least well-known because uh, I think it was only in 1990 that a very accessible version of that was published. I know there was the, 18, the 1980 article in the Grazer Philosophische Studien uh, and the Lindley Lecture at the University of Kansas and a tantalizing footnote in Belief in the Basis of Meaning. But it was really only in 1990 that a a statement of it was made really accessible and fully related to your work on the theory of truth. So um, I wonder if you could say a little bit about the concept of a unified theory and the basic data and uh, that it operates on and the concepts it uses. Right. Uh, 
yes, I, I think I should say there's an explanation for, for why the more detailed explanation uh, of the theory or description of it uh, waited so long, and that was I hadn't worked out the details in a satisfactory way uh, at the beginning. I just I, I knew what the theory should do uh, and wh what it had to work on, uh, and I thought I knew how to proceed, uh, and it turned out that I was wrong. I, I, perhaps if you prompt me, I'll, I will say a little bit about that. But uh, what what you're asking me now? What is the theory? Yeah. Uh, Nuts and bolts, as it were. Nuts and bolts, right. The, uh, a, a little history, I think, helps uh, sort of see what the, what the character of the theory is supposed to be and, and what it's meant to accomplish. Uh, it, it begins by how I always uh, saw Quine's approach to uh, what he called radical translation. Uh, and uh, his, I mean, it's, it's a fairly subtle idea in itself because his idea is uh, what you can uh, uh, imagine yourself observing is situations, situations in which uh, somebody uh, is prompted to hold a sentence true. Uh, uh, he, he talked about prompted assent, uh, and that meant something in the environment uh, prompted you to agree to, assent to uh, a sentence. Uh, I, I, the phrase holding true is mine, rather because I didn't find a more mentalistic way of expressing it. I mean, assent sounds rather, rather behavioral, whereas uh, holding true is clearly uh, 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 something you could do without it acting on it, but, but I think that that difference is, is um, actually not basic. Uh, the, the thing that, that comes out in Quine is uh, people are sent to a sentence because of two things. One, what they believe, and secondly, what, how they think the sentence, what, what it means. So meaning and belief uh, come together to uh, cause Ascent or descent, uh, and Quine actually never emphasized uh, something that seemed to me worth emphasizing, and that is uh, somebody who did build up a theory of meaning or translation uh, uh, for a language had to, at the same time, be building up a theory of belief. Uh, so it would make no sense, for example. Uh, to say, as, as Quine perhaps seemed to say at times, uh, that we have a pretty good grip on what people mean by what they say, but not much grip at all on what they believe. Uh, it seems to me, uh, uh, given his way of working with this, that uh, there was no way to separate those two at all. And the, the uh, one striking feature of Quine's approach, which I've, I've fully taken uh, advantage of myself, uh, is that although the basic data for Quine were uh, prompted ascents and descents, uh, uh, and that, I mean, if somebody ascends to something, they're doing something uh, intentionally and it's full of mentalistic concepts. Nevertheless, uh, there is real progress in going from a prompted assent to the individuation of particular propositional contents. Uh, and I think for a long time many people missed this point. Uh, the progress isn't from something uh, non-mental to something that's mental. It's rather uh, a progress from something very simple that's mental, namely this one thing prompted ascent or descent, uh, to something extremely complex, uh, namely individuated beliefs and, and uh, meanings. But I became dissatisfied with this uh, because I thought, first of all, you never would 
be able to tell that somebody was assenting to something uh, if you didn't have some idea of, of what they were doing intentionally. Uh, and people do things intentionally, not just because of what they believe, but also because of what they want to accomplish. Uh, people would never open their mouths if they didn't, I mean, uh, to say something unless they had quite complex intentions. Uh, so I thought, well, somehow the whole aspect of, of desire or evaluative attitudes has been left out. And there was something else that I thought was left out, and this, this I took equally seriously, and that was uh, uh, assent and dissent are normally uh, partial in, in the sense that, that uh, we only sometimes are completely sure that something is true or that it's false. A lot of the time we're, we have just some degree of conviction that it is, and that's a very important clue to uh, how one is using language and how one is thinking about the world. And one needs a, a, a graded degrees of belief rather than just plunk, true, false, uh, yes, no. Uh, some of our responses are that simple, but a great many are not. And I thought, if one's going to get any serious grip on how to understand people's more theoretical terms, then their, their probabilistic relations or the relations of evidential support are essential. I mean, you, you need to know what it is that you can immediately observe or simply observe, uh, how that's related to more theoretical things, such as what disease somebody has, uh, uh, or what's going on in, in uh, a cloud chamber and so forth. Uh, uh, and to get that, you need, you need to be able to detect evidential support. That if a person believes this, they, that he's immediately observing, then he, this raises his uh, degree of conviction in some more theoretical statement. And if you don't have that clue, you hardly know how to place interesting theoretical uh, uh, sentences. So these two things were missing, uh, and I thought, but what we need to do is to put together decision theory and Quine's approach to the understanding of language and belief. And there's an overlap, clearly, between decision theory and, and uh, let's say, theory of meaning understood in this way, because decision theory is an, an attempt to have a model for how people put together what they want and what they believe in order to arrive at a course of action. And so it, there's belief on the one hand and value on the other. And these are fitted together in decision theory in such a way as to take account of the fact that belief is often partial, uh, what one's called subjective probability. Uh, so what I wanted to do was to put these two things together into one theory. Uh, uh, and I, I had a blind conviction that it could be done. And it took me, I mean, I thought about it for about eight years uh, before I arrived at a, at a way of doing it. Uh, uh, and uh, as I say, I, I thought I knew how to do it, and I gave a lecture uh, somewhere. Uh, on this, uh, and uh, Stieg Kanger, uh, a, a brilliant Swedish logician uh, who, who actually was one of the independent inventors of, of, uh, of uh, possible, worlds. possible world semantics and all that sort of thing. Uh, anyway, he'd been working in this very area, thinking about these things himself, and after I gave this lecture, uh, I said about 20 minutes after I gave it, he, pro he handed me a proof that my proposed way of bringing these two things together uh, uh, led to a contradiction. Was that uh, proposed way regarding negation as a reversal of preference? Operator? No, no, that was the that first was, thought. Yeah. That was the first thought. Uh, uh, um, uh, if, if you prefer uh, P to Q, then you uh, ought to, uh, well, let's see, uh, 
then you ought to prefer not Q to not P. That, that, that clearly doesn't work. Uh, I, I, I didn't make that mistake. I just saw it was a start. Yeah. Uh, and uh, here's how I tried to improve it. I mean, this is simple enough to, I think, we'll get into it. Uh, uh, I thought, well, look, if somebody prefers P to Q, then surely they prefer either P or Q, where you only get one, to Q, right? I mean, P exclusive or Q uh, should be preferred to Q if one prefers P to Q. Seems common sense, doesn't it? I mean, uh, uh, you, you, you'd rather have some chance of getting P uh, uh, to being sure of getting Q uh, if you like P better than Q. Well, that turns out to be inconsistent with the standard axioms of decision theory. Oh dear. And, and uh, so uh, it just seemed so sensible to me that I couldn't believe it was wrong. Uh, but Kanger saw that it was. And the argument is, I'm not going to go into that, but it only takes two pages to prove it. Uh, so then I went back to the drawing board and arrived at a much more intricate way of doing it, which depended on the work of Richard Jeffrey, uh, who had uh, de developed a, a new form of decision theory, which is quite different in some respects uh, from the usual Bayesian approach. Uh, and it suited me perfectly, as it turned out. Uh, and there was a, wa a way to, to uh, extract uh, uh, the propositional contents of uh, beliefs, uh, evaluations or desires, uh, and meanings, all from one kind of data, namely preferring that one sentence be true rather than another. Uh, and uh, the, the steps of that, I think, are too hard to follow without, without uh, writing it down. Uh, but basically, the, the idea is that, that Jeffrey's system uh, for uh, getting quantitative measures of belief and desire, which we call, let's say, subjective probabilities and, and uh, utilities or something like that. These are just technical terms for, for straightforward notions of, of, of beliefs graded as to how probable you think they are to be true, and and uh, values graded by by a degree of of preferential status. Uh, to get to get all that, one only needed to be able to identify the pure sentential connectives. Uh, so two of them would be enough, uh, and and not, uh, or, or in fact one would be enough, uh, uh, and. Uh, neither nor or, or not both. Uh, and so what I, what I discovered was a way to extract uh, not both uh, from, from just choices uh, that a person said, oh, I'd rather have this sentence true rather than that, where the experimenter didn't know what those sentences meant to the person who was choosing. And then the experimenter goes, goes and does some figuring. He's got enough answers and works out the subjective probabilities of all of these sentences for the, for the speaker. And uh, that's much richer information of the very kind that Quine used in radical translation. Right, so we have this, uh, this very interesting and deep result that if an interpreter has access to preferences between sufficiently many sentences, pairwise right. preferences, in the interpretee's language, where the interpreter doesn't yet know what those sentences mean, then the interpreter can first extract uh, the basic logical constants, and then can uh, build up uh, a ranking of those sentences uh, in terms of the degrees of value and belief that the interpretee attaches to them. And 
At this stage, then, the interpreter has, so to speak, everything except what those sentences mean. Uh, and therefore, what the beliefs and, are uh, directed yeah, to. That's what yeah, he has, he has, so to speak, uh, this marvelous ordering, but he doesn't yet know the content right. of the ordering or the intentionality, the relation right. to the world of the ordering. And that's why the second concept, which this interpreter needs, is uh, to know about the external objects and situations which prompt uh, uh, the interpreter to hold one sentence, prefer the truth of one sentence, preferable to another. And uh, so uh, in the unified theory, then, we envisage the interpreter as having got the preference ranking or having got sufficiently rich data about the preference ranking, relating this preference ranking to the uh, environment uh, shared by interpreter and interpretee, and this then giving the hold of the interpretee's psychology and understanding of language. So in a sense, we have the whole of that understanding insofar as this informal sketch of how it might be done is correct. We have the whole of that understanding pivoting on uh, the uh, causation of preference of one sentence to another. Now, uh, this does raise a question about the role of the radical interpreter, which I'll have a shot at putting this way. If we look at the radical interpreter as he first appears in your paper, Radical Interpretation, He's almost like a field linguist. I mean, I, I know that that's led to a lot of misunderstanding, uh, but uh, one could envisage him as noting down what people say when, and then uh, retiring to his study to see how he can represent that in terms of a theory of truth. But of course, in the case uh, now that we're dealing with a much more abstract theory, which doesn't allow the interpreter to presuppose the everyday understanding in terms of desire and belief of what the interpreter is doing, doesn't allow him to explicitly presuppose that. Rather, we've got a theory in which what the interpreter has to take as his data are the uh, causation of preferences or between sentences, the apparent causation of preferences between sentences, as one might say. And when we finally submit this data to this much more extensive theoretical machinery we have, meaning, belief, and desire. But of course, then, this interpreter is not at all like a field linguist, not at all like a child trying to understand his first language. Indeed, it's not so clear that we, or, or it's not so clear to me that one would want to represent him as uh, a person making sense of things at all, rather than uh, so to speak, a placeholder for an intellectual operation. So in a sense, as one might say, when we reach the final goal of casting light by the notion of radical interpretation, the radical interpreter as a human figure almost drops out of the picture. You're right. Uh, the, it, uh, I've, I've described it as a conceptual exercise. And the point of the exercise uh, is to show that there is a complicated pattern that we have to identify in a person's behavior, including their verbal behavior, uh, if we're going to understand what they mean, what they want, what they're doing. Uh, uh, so the, the theory describes such a pattern, uh, uh, perhaps perhaps rather cr crudely. Well, it is, it is crude in the, in the sense that it's much more precise in certain ways than anybody's actual thinking is, but it nevertheless uh, is a rational pattern, and you can say exactly why it's a rational uh, pattern, uh, because uh, the, the theory of meaning is one which brings out the logical relations between different sentences, and therefore between beliefs that would be expressed by them, uh, and decision theory assumes 
uh, a certain amount of logic on the part of anybody that it describes, and it also uh, uh, assumes that people are rational in their decisions in the light of what their particular beliefs and values happen to be. Uh, now, but one can suppose that these theories uh, are idealized uh, pictures, but nevertheless, they make a serious stab at describing uh, what any of us would take to be coherence uh, in one's views and, and uh, a coherence involving one's actions uh, and one in, in how one talks, what one means by what one says. Uh, and the other factor is, is uh, there, there, there's, there's the kind of pattern we have to identify, the kind of pattern. I won't say in complete detail or sharply, but, but well enough to make sense of the people. The second aim is to show that there's some way that, that an interpreter, that is any of us, could get into it uh, without begging the question. That is, without supposing somehow we first figure out what people want and then we go from there to all the rest. Uh, but the question would be, how do we know the contents of those desires unless we have this whole pattern before us? So uh, a, a big part of the inspiration uh, was that we can't get one part of one aspect of this pattern completely right and then go on to the next and then on to the next. Uh, we've got to illuminate it as a whole. Uh, and so there must be a way to get into it from, so to speak, from the outside. Uh, and so the, the unified theory is meant to show what kind of a pattern we, we are looking for, in fact. Uh, and uh, a hint as to how we could get at it. Uh, now, I don't think it's a true picture of how we get at it. Uh, I think we get at it all sorts of ways. We have a, a, a hundred uh, hunches, uh, uh, abilities at picking up things that people are, are interested in, what they're doing, and, and so forth. And we use all of that in actually working our way into this pattern. And the radical, well, let's say the, the, the jungle linguist uh, has got an enormous amount of general information about how people work. Uh, and he's not going to throw any of that away. And he has a lot of, of uh, ideas about how languages work. So he isn't going to start out with this poverty-stricken uh, set of data. And none of us do. Uh, it, the point is to see to get any description of how we could have done it. And if, if we could have done it in this, this rather artificial way, very artificial way, uh, and of course, we can do it other ways too. There's, a, there's a, uh, an interesting um, uh, ambivalence about this in your written work, mm -hmm. where uh, particularly in the structure and content of truth, your paragraph says, uh, that of course you don't think that this uh, this is not meant to cast light on how we actually proceed. But then in a footnote you say it's not so clear that it's that divorced from it because the uh, radical interpreter construed as someone who's collecting information about uh, preferences of sentences he doesn't or she doesn't yet understand is a bit like a, a psychologist in a decision theory experiment with the assumption that the psychologist understands the sentences that he's asking the uh, uh, person in the experiment about preferences over, that that assumption's dropped. So I wonder if there is interest in carrying on the question uh, how this intellectual structure does relate to how we actually proceed there's a natural way of doing it is to think of ourselves as having access to the preference ordering uh, and watching the interpreter move about the world. And I think this would be a valuable exercise. That is, asking ourselves which changes in the ordering would be connected with the ascription of which contents and why. Mm 
And I know in your work you, you've uh, stressed that um, the changes in uh, degrees of belief that would be connected with observation or the holding of a likely theory. There's another one that seems equally clear, which is that um, uh, there ought at any time in this preference ordering to be a kind of leading sentence, the one that the uh, interpretee attaches the greatest discounted value to. And we ought constantly to see that leading sentence falling as the interpretee moves around the world because what he'll be doing moving around the world will be satisfying that leading sentence discounted desire. So if we think of the preference ordering, it seems like there ought to be a constant series of changes in the preference ordering that in fact would enable us to get quite a fix on what the interpreter was doing, even if we took it as, rad as abstractly and radically as that. Does that seem? Absolutely. Uh, uh, I mean, it's not just with values, uh, uh, or let's say it comes in in several ways. Uh, the asking of questions, uh, for, for example. Uh, uh, well, I mean, if a person gets the answer, uh, they'll act in certain ways, and that will be a clue to what the question was and what the answer was. Uh, or, let's say, take commands. Uh, uh, one st uh, stops issuing the command when it's obeyed. So, so I mean, there, there are many connections yeah. that, that go very directly to, to action, uh, uh, where we can key action to changes in the belief structure, uh, the, the desire structure, and so forth. So, no, I completely agree with you. And, and uh, this doesn't come out in the formal statement of the unified theory. Uh, it's the kind of thing that one ought to say about it, though after one is finished. Uh, and, uh, in fact, I thought in, in your writing you, you've done a lot of uh, a lot of tracking down how those relations are established. I mean, I did partly come to it myself because I did a lot of, of uh, experimental work, uh, uh, and and uh, you can't you can't test decision theory without offering people uh, what they take to be fairly complicated things. I mean, such as uh, uh, what are you willing to bet uh, uh, in order to get so-and-so? Uh, and uh, you have to be able to describe that to them. Uh, and I, I did uh, quite a lot of experiments uh, along these lines with, with uh, Patrick Soupies uh, and uh, Jacob Marshak, an economist. And it only slowly uh, became clear to me that subjects didn't necessarily understand the questions they were being asked or the, op the options they were being offered in the same way that the experimenter understood them. So the actual protocols were the person chose to have this sentence true rather than this sentence. And now there's an additional problem, that is, how did they understand those sentences? And in fact, the, I've referred to this more than once, the last experiment I did uh, was uh, designed to test my suspicion uh, that this was often the big problem. That is, what did people take themselves to be offered? How did they understand these instructions? Uh, I mean, of course, psychologists are onto this sort of thing, and they know that how how you word questionnaires makes all the difference. But this was a little little more basic than that. The, the whole question of what does this sentence mean to this person yeah. uh, comes to the fore. Now, there's then one question more that I'd like to ask about this, because this takes me to the, uh, the topic that I introduced at the beginning. Uh, if we think of the radical interpreter as you think of him in the, or her in the unified theory, of working with preferences over sentences, then it surely must be the case that the, uh, these preferences over sentences will also fit with the actions that the uh, interpreter uh, performs. So that 
The idea that we find in Wittgenstein's intuitive stabs at this matter, that interpretation rests on a kind of order in behavior in which utterance must, in the large, concur with action, uh, in the way he tried to bring out in his rule-following thing, it seems that your unified theory discerns that same order, obviously in a much more detailed way, and in a way which explains, or promises to explain, uh, the connections between the elements. But I'm struck by that particular convergence. Yes, well, uh, you, you, you've made it vivid to me uh, uh, in, in what you've written, because I, I certainly wasn't aware that all that was there. Uh, and, and in fact, there are two things here that, that strike me. So many people fastened on Wittgenstein's uh, phrase uh, connecting use and meaning, uh, and uh, a lot of people, at least at one time, treated this as if it offered a completely new way of getting into meaning uh, that would bypass anything like formal semantics or anything of that sort. Uh, and of course, the point is that the notion of use uh, taken by itself doesn't do you anything. I mean, the only good it does is to remind you that what words mean depends on people and, and how they act with regard to them. That is certainly worth being reminded of always. Uh, but once you've been reminded of it, uh, it doesn't tell you what aspect of use is the relevant one, or what aspects of use are the ones to look for when you're trying to connect language with behavior. Uh, and uh, what, what you're convincing me of is uh, uh, Wittgenstein didn't just rest with that simple formula at all. He had definite ideas about how to make the connections. Yeah, it seems very interesting to me that the, the same order uh, mm -hmm. is, is there in both this intuitive formulation and uh, this much more powerful and articulate theoretical one. I'm delighted that uh, we've managed to persuade um, Jim to stay on uh, to give us some further illumination, which follows on very naturally from the previous conversation on the theory of irrationality. Uh, Jim. Uh, Donald, last time we were talking about interpretation as a relation between an interpreter and an interpretee, in which the interpreter could gain the best and the most firmly grounded theory by attending as systematically as possible to the interpretee's preferences. And it's uh, always struck me as interesting that uh, the situation in which the interpreter has unfettered access or the greatest access possible to the interpreter's preferences is that which Freud tried to establish in his psychotherapeutic practice in order to come to understand his analyzans better. And uh, I'd like to uh, take up uh, some questions about that now. You've often emphasized how, given the constitutive role that rationality plays in our understanding of one another, and we saw that in discussing the unified theory, uh, this creates a prima facie problem about the explanation of phenomena which are irrational. And you've picked on two phenomena particularly, acrosia, or weakness of the will, and self-deception. And you've proposed that the explanation of both those phenomena might be aided by uh, um, doing something which Freud also did, and which links your work to his, that is regarding the mind, the interpreters regarding the mind of the interpreter as in some way divided. Could you explain how uh, taking an interpreter as having a divided mind might help us to understand something of the interpreter's irrationality. 
Well, I must, I must say that this is uh, a, a view uh, which I, I arrived at even though I certainly resisted it for a very long time. Uh, that is, I, my, uh, I can remember very well that I used to think the whole idea of the mind being divided uh, had in it the seeds of a uh, paradox uh, which couldn't really be resolved uh, as if uh, one somehow imagined uh, these arguments going on in one's mind uh, as if there were two people in there arguing and uh, then the question would become but wait, who, who is going to settle it? Uh, uh, there must be a third person there who is uh, uh, the, the uh, arbitrator, the decider, or uh, alternatively the chairman of the board, uh, and all of these these uh, metaphors seem to be to be extremely hard to cash in because they they seem a little like uh, some forms of empiricism where uh, there are all these uh, uh, things appearing in the mind, and then you need somebody inside there to be looking at them. Uh, and this seemed to be uh, introduced the same sort of difficulty. Uh, uh, so why, why did I, why did I f finally decide that, that uh, the, something something right about the idea of the divided mind. Uh, uh, of course, we, we, we do find it a lot of philosophers, as well as in Freud, uh, Plato through Butler and many others. Uh, the, the, the problem that it seemed to be impossible to solve without it uh, is something like this. Uh, of course, we don't understand any form of irrationality uh, if we're thinking of, of a creature that may not have any rationality. That is, irrationality is a disease of rationality. It's not just absence of rationality. And so, you know, in order to make any sense of an attribution of irrationality, we have to already have discovered a lot of uh, coherence uh, in a person's thinking. Uh, uh, coherence, well, that means rationality, uh, things that fit together. Because it's not as though you can take states of belief, specify them, and say, now, uh, anybody can believe any set of these. Uh, you can't believe any set of them. Uh, there, uh, because if you can't fit various beliefs together, they're not beliefs. I mean, what defines a belief uh, is its propositional content. And the propositional content establishes relations between different ones. Uh, if you don't find those relations, you've lost a major clue to what the belief is or even to its being a state of belief. So, I mean, that's what sets the problem, is now you say, that's how we understand minds, is by finding a degree of coherence in them. Now, irrationality is incoherence somewhere. Something doesn't fit together. Uh, and, of course, uh, we, we see that it's not as though in irrationality there are no relations even between the parts that are incoherent. Uh, I, for example, we have some tendency to believe what we wish were true. Uh, wishful thinking, it's a, one of the simplest forms of irrationality. Uh, but, uh, but of course, the desire that something be true is not a good reason to believe that it's true. Uh, uh, 
I mean, it's not a good reason in the ordinary sense. It doesn't provide evidence for the truth of, of uh, a belief that, that it would be nice if it were true. Uh, so somehow or other, two parts, uh, two things, two aspects of the mind, in this case, the, the desire and the belief, are interacting, but not in the domain of rationality. Uh, now, uh, there, there already one sees uh, one element of Freud's way of thinking about the mind uh, uh, as these different aspects of the mind exerting an influence on one another, but not through pure rationality, uh, sometimes very impure uh, rationality. Though, of course, uh, it's not as though one can't explain uh, these things in a rather ordinary way. Uh, well, of course, we're, uh, if we're not sure about the truth of something, uh, we're, we'll feel better if we think the one that we would like to be true is true. Well, if we feel better, that's, that can be a motive uh, in itself to, to uh, I mean, if, if, if we could push a button and believe something just by pushing it, then we'd have a motive for pushing the button. Uh, uh, the, the, the trouble is, it's hard to see how you can forget uh, what, what you believed without the wanting, so, so to speak, or how you can overlook the fact that your reason for believing something uh, isn't a good reason. Uh, now, it's, it's simple considerations like that, that is, cases where there's a causal relation between different states of mind without there being a rational relation that pushes us in the direction of saying people must be somehow holding certain things uh, back from themselves. That is just uh, failing in a way that one can often understand perfectly well, failing to put two and two together. Uh, uh, I mean, here, here I really know that I've got better reasons for doing so-and-so than what I am doing. But if I'm just going to go ahead and do it anyway, I have to somehow put aside uh, those reasons that, that uh, push in the other direction, put them aside. I can't put them out of my mind, but I can, uh, I can because we do, uh, uh, fail to, to uh, focus uh, on the conflict. Uh, now, it's the failure to focus on it, failure to bring these things flatly in, into, in, into the picture at the same time, that is all that I mean by a divided mind. It's, it's not as though there's some, uh, as, it's not as if I have two minds, or three or four, uh, and they don't have anything to do with each other. Uh, uh, no, it's not, it's not a territorial boundary for me, uh, and uh, that may or may not be a difference with Freud. I, I'm a little unsure about that. A, a, the, the strongest way to put this would be to say, uh, uh, I don't think a person can just flat out uh, believe uh, uh, any proposition of the form P and not P. Uh, you can't hold that in your mind at the same time. It's just impossible. But you can have in your mind the belief that P and the belief that not P. The, 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 here we're bracketing things in a different way. One is a belief in the, in the conjunction. The other is just that you have both of these beliefs, but you don't conjoin them. Uh, and now, th th that's a, th the simplest way of saying there the mind is divided, because since these beliefs concern the same proposition, it would be natural to bring them together. But you can't bring them together without destroying one of them. Uh, so uh, in, in order to understand what's going on in these situations, I think you have to suppose that sometimes we fail to do what would be natural or normal to do, bring things together which are in conflict with each other in some way.
But surely it must be in a way both deeper and more detailed than that, even in the most minimal account you would try to give, because there's got to be something active about self-deception uh, that explains why we call it so. Yes. And that requires, uh, it, it seems to me from reading your work, that requires something that is not like too homunculi, and again, although we can discuss this a little more, not either like Freud's divisions, but something, what, what one might say, two groups of systematically related motives, which relate to one another in something like the way people right. relate to one another. Yes, that, that's, that's right. Uh, uh, I think there are genuine cases uh, that fit this description, uh, that one actually performs actions, some of them might be just uh, mental actions, but one performs actions intentionally uh, with, the, with the intention of coming to believe something that one doesn't. Uh, and, and where furthermore, part of the, part of the motive uh, uh, is that one has in mind the very belief that one wants to lose. Uh, I mean, because if you didn't have that, you wouldn't be driven to try to change it. Uh, and now I, I, I've discovered, uh, uh, since writing on the subject, uh, that many philosophers just think there are no situations that can be properly described that way. Uh, so if that's so, then of course, the notion of self-deception can't be taken at all literally. It's not as though we're actually doing something to deceive ourselves in the way in which we might do something to deceive somebody else. Uh, uh, they think that's just too, too much to, 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 uh, to uh, swallow. Uh, but I think there really are cases that are like that. I think well, we, we talk about self-deception in many different situations, and uh, not all of them by any means satisfy this description. The point about this one is it's the hardest to explain if it, if it happens, and it seems to me it does. Uh, but if it does, it's clear that there are certain things that we have to somehow blank out I mean, we can't see both that it's, it's, it's because uh, I know that I'm bald, uh, that I would, that I act in such a way as to hide that from myself. Uh, I mean, just by uh, holding my head at a certain angle or, or avoiding lighting of certain sorts. So the, the, these are actions that are intentional. It's not as though I'm doing them by accident or without thinking about it. They have a point. Uh, and the point, the point is to make me or give me a chance of believing uh, what I know to be false. Well, in, in fact, one sees this all the time if one watches people in front of the mirror. Oh, of that is that's you, a, that's that's why I took uh, the example. Yeah, I mean, that, uh, <laughs> uh, people um, uh, f for example, people suck in their guts right. uh, in just the way that uh, is required, given the gut they have, right. in order <laughs> to give themselves a visual impression, right. uh, which would, in ordinary circumstances, be a basis for belief that they have no such gut. Mm -hmm. And they take away from that mirror a sense that this is how they look. So I think people do this uh, uh, very much more. Uh, often than philosophers who think this doesn't happen are inclined to suppose. Nobody should think that these remarks are autobiographical. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, and uh, um, it seems to me, too, that actually people, one of the things that people most commonly do in order to get themselves to believe what they know they would otherwise not believe on the basis of the evidence is to say things to themselves. Right. I mean, in every day, every day in every way, I'm getting better and better. Yes, good. Is uh, a uh, a motto that obviously has its uses, but its uses aren't to acquaint one with one's own 
moral progress. <laughs> uh, but now, given that we think that that kind of thing is so, first of all, certainly, the, uh, the, um, the, the side of the deceiver must have its own motivational structure, and the side of the deceived must have its own motivational structure too, because in this case, I, as deceiver, am actually working on my own mind. Right. So it isn't just not putting things together, it's actually giving evidence against the putting of them together, or providing right. oneself with evidence against Quite right. the putting of it together, so Quite that right. there's a, a, a kind of deeper connection. And then there's more explanation to be done if one asks what motives one does it for on the one side, and uh, how one affects oneself on the other. Uh, it might help if we took uh, an example here. Um, one I often like to use is that of Anna Karenina, who, uh, after she met Vronsky and convinced herself that she had no interest in him, would always go to the social events where Vronsky was to be, telling herself that uh, she was keeping this matter in check. And then once Vronsky doesn't turn up, and Tolstoy says Emma realized that not only was uh, she uh, disappointed that Vronsky wasn't there, but indeed that Vronsky's pursuit had become the main thing in her life, and that she'd been deceiving herself about this. So we can imagine that the kind of internal dialogue she would have had was, when I told myself I was going to this party to meet so-and-so, I was actually lying to myself. I was right. trying to convince myself of something which, if I'd reflected on it, I would have known was uh, untrue. Right. So that's, that's a much more active role than just the keeping of things together. Quite, yes. yes. That was quite a part. Do you think it goes further much? this active role of one part of the self oh, I, in deceiving I, the other? I, I, yes, I think it can. Uh, uh, I, in fact, I, I just wrote a paper which hasn't yet been published, uh, uh, in which I use Madame Bovary as an example, because there it's absolutely clear that uh, Emma constantly does things uh, to convince herself of what she knows to be false. I mean, that, she, that uh, uh, she, uh, she imagines herself in all of these glorious circumstances, uh, all of which, of course, she knows she's not actually in, and, and um, of course, has a tragic degree of success in convincing herself uh, of what she knows to be false. Uh, no, uh, I mean, literature is a good place to look for these things, not, 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 not because it's the only place it happens, uh, but because it's described in such a convincing way mm. that, that one recognizes, yes, this is the way people are. Uh, and not everybody gets in quite as much trouble as she did, but, but, uh, but, but you recognize the psychological truth of descriptions of this sort. No, I, I think the, uh, the idea of, of uh, acting out as a way of convincing yourself that you are, or that your situation is different from what it actually is, uh, is is very common. And and I might I might add, we shouldn't think that it's always bad. On the on the contrary, uh, uh, it's one way of actually improving oneself. Uh, it is to uh, to act as if you were better than you are. <laughs> Quite so. Uh, now, one of the examples that you gave in uh, your paper, Paradoxes of Irrationality, was taken from Freud. It was of a man who uh, first uh, takes a branch away from a place where it's protruding from a hedge, yeah. and then uh, later thinks that this was uh, not a good thing to have done, and so uh, replaces it. And, uh, an interesting thing about that is that that's taken from, as of course you know, taken from Freud's case of the rat man. Right. And Freud represents it as uh, um, very similar to the thing that this patient of his 
does, uh, which was, for example, he saw a stone in the road and he imagined that his girlfriend's carriage might be wrecked against it. And so he took the stone out of the road and then a little later decided that this was foolish and, interestingly enough, pretty much uh, in order to do the rational thing, <laughs> went and put it back. <laughs> yes. But what, what Freud's theory, or what Freud's account of the case stresses is that in this case we actually know the roots of the division in the man's mind, which is that uh, uh, the roots between hostility towards and love for his girlfriend, which uh, the conflict reached a kind of pitch with the idea of her going away, and hence in putting the stone back, he was actually giving expression to the hostile wish that mm. she should come to grief mm. in going uh, away from him. And although that you give, or the similar case, you give as an example of Aprazia, we can easily imagine that it's a case of self-deception too, because he might say when asked that I'm doing this in order to uh, uh, do the reasonable thing. Why take a stone out? And yet he might, even then, or might remember that as he did it, he thought, I hope she smashes to bits on this. And that would give us the clue that it was self-deception. So, in Freud's account, the thing that constantly divides the mind in the way uh, underneath uh, the divisions that are needed to explain Akrazian self-deception is usually love and hatred for the same object. Do you think that's a, uh, a powerful source of the kind of division that you might be? Well, it certainly could be. It certainly could be. Uh, and uh, I, I don't uh, pretend to ha have a deep theory uh, of the sort that Freud did. Uh, I mean, I'm, not, I'm neither for nor against it. I, I mean, it's, all, it's often thrillingly uh, suggestive or even persuasive. Uh, uh, and that must prove something. Uh, but um, but I, I think, uh, to put it a slightly different way, I think in order to get any picture of, of uh, how to think about cases of irrationality, one has to accept some of the things in Freud for which he's been much criticized by philosophers. And uh, that I am convinced of. Uh, uh, one of the things for which he's been crit criticized, of course, is the divided mind. And I'm saying I don't see how to get away from that or why we should. Uh, the, the second thing is uh, people are often critical of Freud as if he were confusing uh, the way in which we explain actions causally, but partly in terms of their propositional con the con propositional contents of beliefs, desires, and intentions, uh, uh, he goes, goes from that to treating these things as if they were just forces, uh, uh, leaving out the, the propositional content, the work that that does in it. And it's not as though he ever drops either of those things completely, but there sometimes seems to be some confusion. Uh, uh, and I mean, the, the idea that, that uh, some particular motive, for example, or, uh, is, is like a blind force that's uh, shoving its way through, through uh, pipes that go in various directions through the brain and so forth. And I'm saying, well, there's something to that. Uh, in irrationality, one part of the one one part of the mind is pushing another part around, not in not in the uh, field of rationality, but but uh, as, as in wishful thinking or any any of these examples. I mean, all all of them require that we find something like that. So so uh, I, I see myself as defending Freud against certain basic 
philosophical attacks. Let me ask you about one more thing in connection here, because in Freud, the the um, the metaphor of force and uh, pressure uh, occurs really most in connection with what you described earlier as the simplest form of irrationality in a way. Mm -hmm. That is in the direction of imagining, uh, often in action, but in the direction of imagining that things are as we would want them to be. Uh, and it seems to me that that has a certain logic which may itself be slightly detached from the notion of rationality uh, in the following way, that when we rationally satisfy uh, a desire, what brings the process to a halt is that we come to believe that the desired situation has obtained. Mm -hmm. So there's something close to rationality in the mind producing in itself uh, a wishfully motivated representation of that same phenomenon. It's irrational, but the mind is putting the brakes on its own desires in a way that mimics what happens when it actually satisfies them. So there's a way in which, even though it's irrational, it has a logic which is connected with that of rationality. Yes. Yes, well, well uh, that's right. That ties in uh, with what I was saying about uh, if we believe something that, that we wish were not the case, we have a motive to change it. Uh, e even though, if we set about changing it, that's irrational. And, uh, so, I mean, there you get a kind of what looks like a paradox right on the face of it, which nevertheless can be resolved. One of the things that, that we haven't touched on, though, that I think uh, really calls for something of, of a Freudian sort uh, is the fact that in a self-deception, we sometimes seem to be working to convince ourselves of something that we wish were not the case. very jealous types, for, for example, uh, often quite yes. clearly, yes. I mean, yes. quite clearly do this. Uh, and that's harder to explain. It seems to me you have to go a, le a level deeper uh, to rationalize that. I mean, there's a sense in which uh, these explanations of irrationality partly rationalize the irrationality that they uh, uh, Partly, of course, they can't completely, or it wouldn't be irrational. Uh, but, but we can see that somebody has a motive for doing something irrational, uh, and that rationalizes it in a sense. I mean, it brings it within, within part of it, uh, 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 an unexpectedly large part of it, uh, into the range of rationality. Uh, I mean, that's what seems to me to be so wonderful about Freud. That well, and, shows. and that particular kind of case illustrates, the, I think, very well the continuity between your views and Freud's. Because the deeper explanation of that mm. kind of phenomenon that Freud provides mm. hinges on the ultimate desirability of being a particular kind of person to oneself, and in particular, a person from whom the kinds of bad motives that uh, are located in the spouse whom one is irrationally finding reason to be jealous of are motives which above all one wishes to be free of oneself. Right. So that once one has projected the deviousness into the other, uh, one is free of it oneself, but then has to find all kinds of ways to keep the other as devious and threatening, much to one's own discomfort. So in a sense, Freud does find a, a logic right. It's yes. quite fully rational behind yeah. it. Yes, good, good. Mm -hmm. 